it would help people believe in God if he were to reduce their suffering and not make the world into such a place where it, it seems unlikely that a loving ruler exists. He didn't really address the point about salvation. I, I would like to know whether all these uh, non-Christians in the world, according to him, I mean, there, there are billions of them, does he really think that they are all uh, going to be uh, eternally tormented in hell? Um, surely God must want everyone to believe, just to avoid hell, I even if he's provided evidence and uh, they haven't picked up on it, uh, he should say to them, those adults, they need more. And he should provide more, uh, just to get them to escape uh, eternal torment in hell. I mean, he shouldn't be reluctant. He shouldn't hold back. I would like to know why it is that uh, so many people in Asia uh, are non-Christian. I mean, Dr. Craig seems to say that, well, those who are somehow ready for it, God supplies them with the evidence and the other people, he knows he can read their hearts, he doesn't, he doesn't bother with them, but why so many in Asia get left out and so many in this country uh, are given the evidence to become Christians? He says that God is evident in nature and God is evident in conscience. I don't see that that is so. How is God evident in nature? You mean this uh, abstract appeal to the origin of the universe? Uh, this abstract appeal to the combination of physical constants in the universe? Uh, what does he mean by evident in nature? And evident in conscience? No, we can explain conscience in other ways. It could be that people have a genetic disposition to want to cooperate with one another, and that would explain conscience. God certainly could do more to help people believe. Um, Dr. Craig says it's the people's fault for not believing, but I don't see that it's the people's fault. Uh, certainly, um, if God were to uh, do skywriting or something like that, at least the basic message could get out. Everybody would believe in God, and then they could make a choice whether to follow Jesus or not. As long as they are non-believers in God, they're not even in a position where they could make the kind of choice that the Christians want them, I mean, to be in that position that the Christians want them to be in, whether to choose or deny. Okay, now to go over to his arguments, he, he says that there could be such a thing as simultaneous causation. He gives the example of the bowling ball on top of the pillow. Um, I don't see that that's simultaneous causation. I mean, you put a bowling ball on a pillow, presses it down. The, uh, you, you, you could think of a layer of molecules. There's the bowling ball molecules and the pillow molecules. Well, there's the, the bottom bowling ball mo molecule that comes in contact with the top pillow molecule. And that molecule presses down on the pillow molecule, which presses another pillow molecule, which presses another, and so on. Seems to me that the cause is coming before the effect there. The, the uh, force from the bowling ball molecules comes first and exerts downward pressure, and that causes the uh, pillow molecules to be depressed. So that isn't simultaneous causation at all. That's cause coming before effect, which is our common concept of causality. He talks about the statue in the sand. We, we find a statue in the sand, we say, well, that couldn't have come by chance. But why is that? It's, it's because we have some knowledge of these things. We, we know about statues and we know about sand. And that's why we say it couldn't have come about by chance. But we don't know these things in the case of the formation of the physical constants of the universe. We, we don't have the relevant background information to make that kind of judgment. He says that my alternate hypotheses are not better than his God hypothesis. But remember, my alternate hypotheses do not need to be better. They only need to be at least as good. All I need is one alternate hypothesis that is at least as good as the God hypothesis, and that shows that his proof does not go through. Because in order for his proof to go through, he has to show that the God hypothesis is better than all the others. It's the best explanation. 
And as long as there's one other hypothesis at least as good, then his proof is a failure. Um, he talks about a cumulative case. He says he's got all these in independent uh, uh, sources of evidence about God and they all somehow come together. But I, I don't understand that because, okay, he suppose his argument for uh, a cause of the universe, suppose that goes through. So he, he shows that there's some kind of being that caused the universe. All right, now he's got another argument for a, a cause for the, um, the physical constants being the way they are. Okay, maybe there's a being that did that. And then he's got a, somehow a cause for objective morality. He's got a being that caused that. Um, and then he's got a cause for the resurrection that brought Jesus back to life. What I want to know is why believe that all of these beings, this one, this one, this one, this one, that they're all one and the same being? Where is his argument to show that all of these beings are the one and the same being? It's only when he can prove that, that he's got a cumulative case for the existence of God. Now, so far as objective moral value is concerned, I, I want to say that it's possible to believe in objective moral value and still deny God's existence. I want to say also that there are good reasons for a subjectivist view on, on values. For one thing, there's no objective proof procedure for settling moral disputes, and that supports a subjectivist outlook. Also, moral properties are not given to us in sense perception. They, they aren't like physical properties, and that's another reason to think that subjectivism is true. He talks about rape and so on, but what about some other examples like, like these? Uh, abortion. Uh, what is the objective moral truth there? What about homosexuality? What is the objective moral truth there? I mean, let him tell us. He says there are objective moral values, you know, absolutes, uh, ethical absolutes. What are they in these examples here? Premarital sex. Is that objectively absolutely wrong? How about cruelty to animals, which is condoned in the Bible? Also child abuse. Divorce and remarriage, which are considered morally wrong in the Bible. Uh, are divorce and remarriage ob objectively morally wrong? In the Bible it says it's, it's wrong for wives to disobey their husbands. Is that objectively wrong? Um, uh, slavery is condoned. So what is the uh, objective truth about that? It says idolatry is wrong and heresy and blasphemy, working on the Sabbath and so on. What is the objective moral truth of that? Time's up. Sorry. <laughs>